Welcome to Type 212 Alpha Sub Brief. I'm Captain Drive Turkey. Let's go. This video is sponsored by CommandoStore.com. CommandoStore.com is celebrating United States independence with an Independence Week sale. CommandoStore.com is the place to go when you're looking for mil spec outerwear and equipment. From field shirts to footwear, Commando Store has you covered. You'll find a wide range of authentic military parkas like the Austrian waterproof Gore-Tex Simtex M65 to the brightly colored Danish M84 Civil Defense Jacket. Commando Store has the best mil-spec boots you can find, like the Swiss KS90 waterproof combat boot to keep your feet dry. My personal favorite is the South African waxy boot with anti-track sole that leaves footprints that appear washed out and old. The waxy boot feels like you're wearing tennis shoes while delivering the protection of a boot. Commando Store has so much more for you to explore. Backpacks, IFAC resupply medical kits, field tools, Unity brand mounts for your firearms, and night vision equipment. All orders shipped to the continental United States are free shipping during this week's sale. That's right, free shipping on all ConUS orders during the Independence Week sale. And don't forget to request box art in the comments. All your art requests will be attempted by our highly motivated staff to swag out your box. Go to commandostore.com and get your kit. Let's start by recognizing the sources. A uh, big thank you to Mr. Saturnax. To Type 212 Alpha, this is a venture between Germany and Italy. This started in Germany, but Italy was quickly signed on as they had similar needs to meet and an aging submarine, I mean, submarine fleet to replace. Uh, the project to replace the 206 was the German submarine and the Saro submarines for Italy are going to be replaced by these new subs. Um, it's designed by a combination of uh, design bureaus, one in Germany, which is the primary one, but also uh, Italy came on board with their Fancantieri Spa. And uh, the German one is in Kiel called the Haldswerk Deutsch Wurf, or HDW for short. Um, the goal is to have a superior littoral water Submarine, littoral meaning shallow, near the coastline, even going up river in some cases. That's all littoral waters. It's not deep blue water uh, capability um, focused. It's focused on shorelines, coastal defense, shallow bodies of water like the Baltic Sea and the Mediterranean. It's certainly not limited to that, but that is the focus performance wise for this platform. They want to be able to support recon operations ashore and at sea, which means special forces and uh, signal intelligence, whether it's through a periscope and radios or sonar, or it's by putting uh, Marines ashore. Uh, they want to have a minimum crew, so automated systems as much as possible to increase endurance or at sea time for this platform. There's going to be modular construction that allows frequent low cost upgrades. That's all the equipment inside is gonna be computer off the shelf technology or COTS. And uh, that's, that's what they're gonna use to uh, make sure they stay up with the latest hardware so they don't have to redesign, say the entire sonar system if they wanna do a simple upgrade. It's gonna be modular now. And one of the biggest things that they've done with this platform is the air independent propulsion. They went a different direction than uh, Sweden went with its Gotland class. And we're gonna talk about this air independent propulsion in a lot of detail, it's fantastic. And they also have some advanced sonar arrays and processing on this relatively small sub that are also impressive. So those are the goals, that's what they want to achieve. And Italy and Germany are working together to do it. So let's begin with Germany with HDW and a second shipyard out of Emden called Thyssen Nordswick GmbH or TNSW for short of Emden. These are two completely different shipyards working together to build this one submarine class. So they're gonna divide the load between the two. They're gonna assemble hulls one and two in Kiel and hulls two and four in Emden. Okay, so they've completely divided up the workload, but they're also building the bow section in Kiel and the stern section in Emden. So each shipyard builds its own half of the submarine, and then the other half gets shipped to it so that they can assemble it later on. So Germany's going to assemble U-31, 32, 33, and 34, four hulls originally in batch one, and they will be completed between the years 2005 and 2007. That's when they're commissioned into the service. 
A second batch is also built, but it's almost nine to 10 years later before they're complete. And this is gonna be hull U35 and 36. Italy has a similar uh, structure, but it's all out of the same shipyard. And uh, they're just gonna build two submarines initially. And then after they rework the process and improve it and upgrade it, they build two more in 2016, 2017 for a total of four submarines operating in the Italian Navy. So in the end, we have six submarines for Germany, four submarines for Italy. The total program uh, completed hulls is 10. There are more planned, but not completed for Germany. All right, so let's talk about construction. Um, obviously built in the shipyards. Here you can see a close up of the sails. Uh, this close up on the upper right hand side is a 212 Alpha with the diver swim out locker there on the starboard side of the, of the hull. I should mention that the hull of this submarine, it's a twin hull or dual hull submarine, double hull. The outer hull is a non-metallic material. So uh, some kind of composite of some kind, they don't go into details, it's really classified as to what it is, but it's non-metallic is, is what they're saying publicly. You can see uh, the small cylinders there on the left-hand side, those are the hydrogen cylinders. Part of this air-independent propulsion is combining liquid oxygen or just pure oxygen with pure hydrogen and making electricity with it. So they have cylinders exterior to the pressure hull uh, in a free flood area between the two hulls, some with oxygen, some with hydrogen. You can see right here clearly the smaller tanks are the hydrogen tanks. Uh, in the beginning, uh, they had a seven bladed screw on the first batch of submarines, but they quickly removed that and put on six bladed, again, non-metallic composite material screw blades onto the second batch of 212s, 212 alphas. And there you can see the vortex dissipator on the very back end of the screw. The picture in the lower right is a picture of a more modern second batch 212 alpha with a six bladed screw. So on the left is the early version, on the right is the newer version. Okay, hydrogen tanks and liquid oxygen tanks. Um, here you can see a really good picture of the liquid oxygen tanks, how they're sitting topside behind the sail, above the pressure hull where the people are, but below the second hull or the outer hull. And there's looks like two tanks there. Obviously they're a lot bigger than, hyd than hydrogen tanks are because at the molecular level, the oxygen atom is physically bigger than the hydrogen atom by a lot. So it needs to have a larger tank to have, you know, equal amounts of fuel going into the engine. All right, so batch one and batch two, uh, here are some of the differences between the two. Uh, the upper one, like we've already talked about, had the seven bladed screw. But if you look at the lower picture, uh, it goes over all the different systems that are a little bit different. Uh, again, the non-metallic hull uh, around the outer side, uh, the six bladed carbon fiber screw is for the newer one. Modified hydrophone planes, rather, they changed the hydroplanes to be a little more efficient going through the water, whether it's on the surface or submerged. And so they got a little more maneuverability out of them, made a little more hydrodynamic, a little bit larger plane surface. And so they can get a little more motion out of it. They have a Callisto comms mast in the new batch. This is a comms mast that does satellite communication, but it's also able to be deployed from depth and it floats. And it can, so the submarine doesn't need to come to periscope depth necessarily to communicate with satellites and through the satellites with special forces and shore facilities. So that is a really cool addition to a diesel boat. This system, this Callisto system has a lot of problems. Uh, the buoy doesn't work reliably. Uh, it was taken off of at least one hull we know about. Uh, I'm not sure if it's even in service at this time, but that's the Callisto comms mast, satellite communication mast. Uh, there's an optotronics mass that they added to hull, uh, batch two rather. So it has not just the primary periscope, but it has a non-penetrating optotronic mast as well. Uh, swimmer airlock is added to the starboard side uh, inside the sail. There's a larger control room. They made the control room a little bit bigger in batch two, and they added active sonar. Now this can get confusing, so I'm gonna explain it now, and again, a little bit later in the lecture. Both hulls, have active mine detection sonars, both batch one and batch two. Batch two 
added a second active sonar that is mainframe active sonar or active operational sonar. They don't go into any detail about it. I don't know the frequencies. Uh, all I know is what they say here on this slide is that it's an AOS active operational sonar and the mine detection sonar on the bow there. All right, so let's talk about PEM, polymer electrolyte membrane. This is the magic that creates electricity from that oxygen and hydrogen I was talking about. Air independent propulsion, completely independent of snorkeling. Um, the reason why it's air independent propulsion is that this energy is 100% used to turn the screw. So it's not air independent power like it is on newer diesel boats, okay? This is still for propulsion only. And the way it works is just like here in the diagram is they have this membrane. The membrane is the secret to making this work. They have a classified material that is between oxygen and hydrogen. Um, and the oxygen acts as the cathode, the hydrogen acts as an anode and the electric electrons want to flow from the hydrogen side to the cathode or oxygen side. And there is enough flow of oxygen to produce a couple things. One, heat. It gets really hot. It also produces water on the oxygen side because when you combine a hydrogen and oxygen, you're left with water. The process of making this heat and making this water is an electrical load or supplies electricity. And it is this engine, this, this new air independent propulsion that is gonna harness this electrical load as this water is created to turn the screw. It's really incredible. It's different than what they use on the Gotland class. All right, so here's a detailed breakdown of how it works together. It's created by a company named Siemens and it's the Permisin electric motor. This is a little confusing because it uses the same three letters, P-E-M as the polymer electrolyte membrane. The polymer electrolyte membrane is inside the Permisan electric motor, okay? Keep that straight. So uh, the, the fuel cells take in the oxygen and the hydrogen as seen here in the uh, diagram. Heat is created whenever that happens. Uh, the resulting water is collected into a reaction water tank and the electricity that is produced by making this water is used in the energy cells. The energy cells are then used to turn the motor. It's pretty clever. Here's a picture of the motor. This is a masterpiece of engineering, how they made this work in such a concise manner while it's taking two volatile substances, creating energy, heat, water, and electricity in a safe, reliable, consistent manner that is also quiet and very well balanced, all in one component. This is the Siemens Permisin Prime Mover. This is the engine that turns the screw. And it does it with only two things, pure oxygen and hydrogen. Pretty incredible. And look how large it is there compared to the gentleman standing next to it. All right, 212 Alpha by the numbers. It is 57 meters long. Notice that uh, batch two is one meter longer than batch one. Uh, other than that, it's all the same in terms of dimensions. Six meters wide, displacement's about you know 1,450 tons. Um, it does have a six bladed propeller now. Know that when they started batch one, they had seven bladed propellers, but they're all six non-metallic uh, composite propellers now. It can do approximately 20 knots submerged. Uh, torpedo tubes, it has six. It has enough stows for 13 torpedoes. It can carry mines externally, but that's not commonly done, but it does have a mine capability. Just know that if they do go on a mining mission, the, the mines are not inside the submarine. The mines are gonna be strapped to the outside and released as they drive over the locations that they wanna mine. That is a little bit old school compared to modern day mining, but it might have a lot to do with the, uh, with the treaty restrictions that they're under. Okay, uh, the air independent power generates uh, 240 kilowatts, quite a bit of kilowatts for just mixing oxygen and hydrogen together. Has officer and crew complement of 27 people and can be submerged for up to 18 days. Um, they, they brag that they can, go, they can go longer than 12 weeks, but they also 
um, set a record of 18 days without snorkeling and without ventilating or coming to the surface or doing anything. They stayed submerged in a diesel boat, uh, traveled, uh, you know, over a thousand miles in 18 days and uh, didn't come up for air during that entire trip. Pretty incredible. All right, so here's some pictures of the ship's control stations. Uh, you can see that uh, it's a single man operation. Guy sits down there and operates the, the levers to drive the ship, you know, forward, up and down. And you can see that the picture on the right is the mechanical backup to the electronic control unit. So if they have to, they can take local or hydraulic control of the, um, of the control planes. And they have that little diagram below them to help them visualize what they're doing as they reposition those four knobs. There are four levers for each of the four cross uh, rudders in the rear. And so if they want to raise the boat, they don't really have to think about, okay, which one do I put in what position? They just use that matrix chart to operate the hull to get the desired result that they want from the, from the rudder. And uh, the little picture on the top there you can see is just some of the systems. Looks like a trim and drain system for ballasting the boat to a neutral buoyancy. That's ship's control station. Okay, combat management system is the MSI 90U Mark II. This combines sonar, radar, periscope data. Uh, periscope data, not just video, but actually pickling or buzzing, we call it in the Navy, buzzing a bearing that the periscope operator is looking at to the fire control system. Uh, it does automatic target motion analysis based on uh, time frequency and time bearing. It also is how you control the torpedo tubes, although you can control them locally as well. Uh, threat identification, it assists in targeting threat tonals on the narrow band side of things. And uh, visual identification, it has a library too for the periscope operator to reference. Uh, data recording and replay is available both on the visual side from the periscope and from the sonar side. This is really key because whenever you're listening to a sonar system, you obviously have 360 degrees around you and you're also looking up and down. So there's multiple tiers to this 360 degree. Oftentimes you'll be listening in one direction when you see visually a noise source in another direction that just ended like it began and ended in less than one second. So by the time you scroll over to it, you don't hear it anymore, but you know something noisy just happened. Well, with this system, they can pause time, rewind it, and listen to it again with the cursor on the right bearing because it is all saved into a buffer that allows the operators to go back in time and listen to bearings that they did not hear the first time. It's, it's a big uh, advancement in real-time data analysis, being able to say, well, you know, we missed something over there. We know something noisy is going on to the starboard now. You know, let's, let's maybe listen to that bearing and possibly miss something else on the port side. So uh, being able to go back in time and listen to those old recordings is really, really key uh, for the sonar world. Uh, video recording, like I said, is a thing. Oh, and there's a built-in simulator. So instead of going to a shore facility and taking up classroom space and all that to simulate operating their equipment, they can actually operate their equipment in port and at sea with false contacts injected into the system. So it's great cost saving and time saving measure and equipment saving uh, measure as well as personnel because you don't need external teachers to teach people in a schoolhouse. They can conduct their own training with their own equipment, gaining experience, um, with the equipment that they're actually going to take to see. So built-in simulation is common in every sonar system now, uh, and they have it here as well. All right, more pictures of the control room. Uh, you can see some of the uh, periscopes down there. That's the optotronics mast uh, that he's looking at, and that is the ESM mast over on the right that detects radars uh, that are topside looking at the submarine. And that's really key in case there's like a periscope high frequency radar that uh, can detect the periscope, they'll know right away and be able to dip. It also has direction finding for the, uh, par for the uh, radar, so they'll get a bearing to it. So they'll know that it's coming from the south or whatever. And there on the left, you can see more control room panels, looks like more ships control and uh, weapons. Oh, that's combat management right there, combat management. All right, let's talk about the Atlas DBQS-40. This is the sonar system. So. This is the bread and butter of the submarine as far as I'm concerned. Um, 
we have multiple arrays. They put a lot of arrays on this thing. First, and surprisingly to me, I honestly did not know this until I made this lecture, they have a towed sonar array on this little diesel boat, which makes sense, especially if it's gonna operate in deeper waters, which it can do. Uh, but for a littoral operation submarine, it is unlikely they'll ever have depth excess for a long towed array. Now it's possible they have what's called a tactical towed array, which is a relatively short towed array that they can just put out a couple hundred feet and it still works great. Uh, even a couple hundred feet is all you need for low frequency. That's what I assume that they have here. They do have active intercept that is different than active transmit. Active intercept is simply a syndrilical hydrophone. It's in the sail that hears active sonar and will give them a bearing to it and how loud it was. So it's active intercept. Passive uh, ranging with the flank array. This is really cool technology. This is something that was coming online at the end of my career where we have flank arrays now that go along the sides of the submarines and all they do is hear the sound and because the array is so long, it's on you know, the side of the submarine or it's just has one array on the bow and one on the stern and there's like some bearing separation between the two, they can triangulate the location of the noise, whether it's active sonar or a transient, based on the time delay from when it reached the bow of your submarine to the aft end of your submarine. That creates a little triangle that points to right where the target is and gives them an idea of range. The range is not Nat's ass, but it's, you know, it can be within, you know, a couple hundred yards, which is not bad. It's all you need for a weapon. So they have this passive ranging flank array. And all it does is, is listen, you know, and it spits out ranges at you. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, active mine detection is on the bow. That's the MAS. Mine active sonar is what that stands for. Always looking forward. Uh, because they're littoral, that's very important that they not you know wander into a minefield. Uh, they do have some own ship noise monitoring arrays. Nothing really fancy there. Every submarine has them now. They're very important to know how loud you are. And if you do have a noise problem, it also helps you isolate what piece of gear is causing the noise. Because these own ship noise monitoring hydrophones are throughout the ship. So they can kind of triangulate the location and based on the frequency that it's hearing, figure out what's going on. Another way of doing this would be to shut down pieces of equipment one or two at a time and see if that noise violation goes away. And then you're like, aha, it's the ice cream maker. You know, we can't turn on the ice cream maker anymore because it makes noise. So that's what that's used for. And then finally, and kind of the, uh, the main array here is the passive chin cylinder array. This is the primary broadband uh, array that the operators are listening to with the headphones on. Uh, looking for contacts. It's right there on the bow. All right, here's the navigation plot. Uh, notice that manual navigation is still done. Even though they have all this equipment, satellites, GPS, they still manually plot their location, and that's key. American submarines do the same thing. Every experienced navigator knows the, the value of manually calculating and verifying your position, and that's what they do here too. It's really good to see this. Uh, with all the tools that they have at their disposal, they're still manually tracking their own position. And there you can see what the periscope looks like to the operators in the control room. So not just the person on the scope sees what's going on outside. Uh, the paraviz is what we call it, is replayed on any of the consoles that selects it. Any console can bring it up and uh, see what the periscope operator is doing. The idea there is more people looking at the paraviz or, you know, the, the, the better chance you have of not missing something. Because if it's just one guy and he scrolls too fast, he may miss that sailboat that is right on top of you, you know? So it's really good. All right, uh, the Callisto buoy array, I kind of already talked about the problems with this, but again, it's a two-way satellite communication that allows them to contact, you know, other commands and their special forces, that's important, using satellite communication. They don't need to come to Periscope Depth to operate this. Uh, when it works, it's great, uh, but the program does have problems with the buoy simply not working, not staying at the proper depth. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work at all. So, uh, and, and it was taken off one of the German submarines. I don't know if the other ones still have it or if they've worked out the issues, that's not clear. But technical problems continue to plague uh, this Callisto radio buoy. All right, so let's take a look at the crew living space. This gives you an idea of what they have uh, to work with. Um, it looks like they have uh, five-man birthing areas, 
And you can see by the number of lockers uh, on the left, there's six individual lockers for personal items, which would imply six people in that birthing space with only five racks, which means someone sharing rack with somebody else. It's very common on submarines, especially on diesel boats, when there just isn't enough space for birthing for everyone. You know, the only people getting their own space is the CO and XO and maybe some senior enlisted men. You know, if you look on the right, you can see there's eight lockers for five bunks, which means, you know, most of those people are sharing bunks with other people. Uh, in that living space. And that's just the way it is. And and whenever you sign up for submarine duty, this is what you're signing up for. All right, cruise mess. This is like the main common area that people can just come together, hang out when they're not on watch. They can also do training here. Uh, typically, there's an entertainment center with a television of some type, even though it's not pictured here. Uh, they also do uh, daily briefings here. Even if you're in port, you'll have like a morning brief with everybody say, this is what we're doing today. This is what's being worked on. Here's the equipment status of everything. Uh, that type of evolution, if it's not done topside on the pier where there's more room for everybody, they can do it down here. Um, you know, if conditions up topside are not positive. And here's some gentlemen just having a chat. Looks like they're having a meal too. All right, so the MTU 16 cylinder v-shape 396 diesel engine this is a very common uh diesel engine for for these uh german submarines german designs uh, mtu's been used you know that's the that's the marine uh engine for just about every type of diesel boat you know it's uh you know eight cylinders by eight cylinders in a v-shape uh very reliable this is just another you know modern upgrade to that and it's, it's one of the things that they can rely on that if all this new technology that they have does not work or fails, they can rely on this, that if they start it up, it's going to run and it's going to provide electricity and they can use that electricity for propulsion if they need to, to get out, uh, to, to move from, from wherever they are. This is extremely reliable. This is the primary diesel for this boat. So whenever they're not using the, um, you know, the oxygen, the hydrogen with the PEM, they can use this. The submarine also has batteries like every other diesel boat. We haven't mentioned that yet. This is how they charge those batteries is by running this diesel engine. Something else the diesel engine does that doesn't get mentioned enough is it recirculates the air inside the submarine from top side. So every time they run the diesel engine, whether it's in a World War II movie or it's, you know, modern day, they're sucking air in from outside through the diesel and of course expelling the exhaust, but it also helps to circulate the air inside the compartments. So the crew's getting fresh air at the same time that this thing is running. All right, torpedo tubes. This was interesting. Um, it has six torpedo tubes. But because of the location of the ejection pumps, which are the big round barrel shaped things right there, uh, being where they are, four of the six torpedo tubes that are 53 centimeters a piece are on the port side. And two are on the starboard side. So it's a little off center. And the reason why it's off center is because of the location of the ejection pumps. Now these ejection pumps are very quiet. Uh, they are piston operated, which surprised me. I think that might be disinformation, but every source I've read that's not classified says that it is a piston that operates these ejection pumps. I have reasons to believe that that's not the case, but we're gonna go with what they say because that's the unclassified answer. Um, so four on the port side, two on the starboard side, a row of three over three, basically, just there's a few more on the port than, than, than on the starboard. They're all the same size, 53 centimeter, and they shoot a number of different weapons. We're, we're gonna get into those next. So here's a close up of the port side offset. So the gentleman there is, you know, he's standing on what is the starboard side of the submarine. You're looking at the front of the submarine as it looks back at you. And you can see how most of the tubes are on the, uh, on the port side there. Also gives you an idea of how big a 53 centimeter torpedo is. Pretty big. All right, here's inside the submarine. Again, you're looking at the tubes. They have the tube open there. That yellow box thing with the handle on it, that's called a battle lantern. And it's basically, you know, a dry battery cell uh, flashlight that is used only in emergencies. Um, why it's mounted inside uh, the tube, I don't know. Maybe they're just doing an inspection. I don't think it's normally supposed to be there. Looks like they, they may just have set it there for this photo. Uh, really no way to tell, but that's what that yellow thing is. And I thought you would like to see how the locking rings work on the back end of the torpedo tube. You see how thick they are. That is solid steel. All right, let's move on to what they shoot. 
So we have uh, the Germans shoot the Sea Hake, which is a heavyweight torpedo, has a large warhead. And the Italians shoot a very similar version of the same weapon that they call Black Shark. And uh, the cool thing about this is, is that it is fiber optically guided. So it does use a fiber optic cable or, you know, yeah, I guess you want to say a fiber optic fiber uh, that, that connects it to the submarine as it's going out swimming around. One of the things that this fiber optic allows them to do is they can listen to the actual audio from the torpedo. So if the torpedo is in passive homing, uh, the sonarman can put on the headphones and hear what the torpedo hears. It's like having a probe out there with a high explosive warhead on it. It's really cool. Uh, we don't have that kind of capability on the United States Navy yet, or at least whenever I was active duty. And that's one of the things, there's other things as well, but that's just one of the things that having a fiber optic cable does because it allows for additional information to be transmitted between the submarine and the weapon. And real-time audio is one of those things. Oh, something cool about the uh, Sea Hake is that you can add multiple batteries to it, which would increase the length of the torpedo. Um, anywhere from two to four batteries. Obviously more batteries gives it longer and longer endurance. So they can load a torpedo that's relatively short range with two batteries, saving them space in the torpedo room and all that. Or they can have a couple of the torpedoes configured with all four batteries installed. So it's full length, but it goes for a very long way. Same torpedo, different ranges, depending on how many battery packs they install on it. All modular. Okay, here's some pictures of torpedo handling. That's how they load them rear first into the submarine. They kind of just slide down. And then once they get down in the torpedo room, they pivot uh, down so they become horizontal again. This is exactly how uh, American submarines load ours. Uh, we use a cradle instead of a sled like they have. Um, well, we, we have a sled too. So we have both a sled and a cradle, whereas they just have what looks like a cradle as the to torpedo gets loaded in there. Okay. Here is the Interactive Defense and Attack for Submarines, the IDAS. So this is really cool. This is something that I've been wanting for the American Navy for years and leave it to the Germans to come up with it first because they're effing brilliant when it comes to designing and engineering things. This is a surface to air missile shot by a submarine, optically guided with a fiber optic cable attached to it, just like the torpedoes that can shoot um, low flying aircraft out to about approximately 12 kilometers. And uh, it's really cool. Uh, it is the first missile that is submerged launched that comes out of the water uh, that's not encapsulated. And encapsulated can mean many different things, but in this case, that black missile that you see in the lower right-hand corner is what comes out of the water, kind of like a ballistic missile does. But a ballistic missile is encapsulated in bubbles all the way up to the surface. A Tomahawk missile is encapsulated in an actual capsule that is ejected from the submarine, floats to the surface where it becomes vertical, and then from that capsule launches the Tomahawk. This is the first missile that is ejected from the tube without any of that. No bubbles around it, no capsule around it. It looks like a finned you know, missile. And even in a high sea state, according to the brochure, the people that make this, even in a high sea state can come out of the water and hit a target. And it's got a little fiber optic lead that connects it to the submarine through the torpedo tube. The magazine that you see there being loaded holds four of these. So they can load this magazine into one of the six torpedo tubes, shoot the magazine one at a time up to four times without ever ejecting the magazine itself and the missiles will fire one at a time. Whenever the magazine is empty, they can backhaul the magazine and offload it in port. It is just incredible. Uh, how accurate this thing is, I have no idea. There's no data at all on how accurate it is. But um, I'd like to think that it is effective since they use it. So they go to sea with this. So helicopter pilots that are out there and, you know, P-7 Poseidons, there's a P-8 Poseidons pilots that are doing low, you know, flying for, looking for submarines, now have a realistic surface-to-air threat in what would otherwise look like open ocean. So this is a game changer in that they're, the helicopters and ASW aircraft are no longer immune during their hunt. Uh, if this gets proliferated, which I'm sure Americans are going to have our version of it too, uh, this is going to change ASW warfare. 
All right. Uh, we also support special forces with these. Um, again, with the uh, second batch, they added that swim out diver hatch on the starboard side. There is some kind of door that opens up from the front, but to get into the people tank, the, the hatch is on the starboard side. Remember, these are double hauled submarines, so they got to get inside the outer hull, which again is non-metallic. And then to get into the people tank, the uh, pressure hull, it's called, they have to go through this airlock chamber that is uh, on, that is in the sail. So here is a really nice picture of Italian special forces swimming outside their submarine. All right, so let's talk about some operations. This is a relatively new submarine, so there's not a lot of history here, but a few interesting things uh, I found online were um, in 2006, uh, U-32 conducted a 1,500 nautical mile submerged transit without snorkeling or surfacing to Rota, Spain. That was from the Baltic Sea to Rota, Spain. Uh, again, it wasn't record breaking, <laughs> but it, that's a long ways without snor surfacing or snorkeling. Um, 2008, 2009, the Italian uh, submarines are deploying with the United States Navy. They're in the Mediterranean, operating for five and six months at a time, proving the endurance of these submarines. They can, they can handle long deployments with NATO fleets. Uh, that's what they achieved there. 2012, uh, S-526 is deployed to the Indian Ocean. So that's an Italian submarine going to the Indian Ocean for a few months and coming back. She also operated in the um, Arabian Sea and uh, the Red Sea. She went through the uh, uh, Su Suez Canal there in Egypt to, to get to that. Okay, 2013, U-32 established a new uh, submerged record for 18 days without snorkeling. Here's where the record gets set in uh, 2013. A German U-boat operated um, went over 1,000 miles uh, without snorkeling or surfacing or doing anything to bring fresh air into the boat. So I'm sure that boat smelled really good at the end of the 18 days, but congrats to them for proving the endurance of this, of this uh, submarine. You know, modern naval warfare uh, may only last 18 days, and that, so that's what they need. Uh, July 2017, uh, U-32 did damage its batteries and was out of service for a year. It's not clear what happened. I don't know if water had gotten into the boat or if they had just put a, you know too much of a load on the battery that shorted it. Uh, they are very uh, closed-lipped about the details of these um, casualties, but we know that they damaged their battery doing something at sea, came back, there was no dry dock available for her, so she had to wait a little bit before she, the repairs began, and uh, she was out of service for about a year. And, uh, October the same year, uh, U-35's uh, rudder is damaged, conducting operations uh, in and around Norway. So uh, it, it's believed that she struck some kind of rock and uh, was, was out of service for a little while. Uh, U-36, which is the second of the batch two submarines for Germany, uh, was used as scavenging parts to keep U-35 operational up until this point. Obviously at this point, there's like, well, we can't use the rudder anymore. They actually had to escort her from Norway back to Kiel to, to get her repaired because of the damage. The damage was that severe. So uh, she had a bit of a hard time. Now at the time of this recording in 2020, uh, the maintenance is better and the submarines are operational again for uh, both Germany and Italy. Uh, they had gone through a, about a year or so where uh, there was a short time where no, of, none of these submarines were operational for a very short time. Uh, that's been remedied. Um, but they have, 2017 to 2019 was a tough time for the German Navy. In 2020, it seems like they're getting their momentum back and their funding back, which is important. All right, so final thoughts on this. Uh, man, it blew me away. I learned a lot making this lecture. It's an absolutely revolutionary air independent propulsion. What Siemens came up with is, is like magic. Uh, my hat's off to them. Those engineers are incredible. Uh, I can't believe they made it work and they did. And uh, so if you can get your hands on one of these submarines, if you're a nation looking for a good diesel boat, I would recommend talking to the Germans about doing this, about making some for you. Uh, they have offensive anti-air capability. That's ASW warfare game changing. Uh, no longer do we have to run and hide from these helicopters and airplanes. We can actually engage them if we need to. Uh, high endurance and station keeping, uh, setting records for diesel boats, being underway for 18 days without any type of surface air replenishment for the crew or machinery. Fantastic. Uh, 
you know, can support special forces, uh, you know, in and around littoral operations and stay on station to retrieve those special forces for up to an 18 day period. Uh, that's that's unheard of. That's fantastic. That's some nuclear powered uh, support, um, you know, measurements right there. You know, whenever whenever the Americans when we support our stuff, we can stay on station for months at a time. That's only because we have the nuclear reactor. They're doing this with a very small but highly capable diesel boat with air independent propulsion. Well done. Heavyweight torpedoes. Those torpedoes can uh, knock out large ships. They have huge warheads on them, uh, so they can get into a deep water Blue Navy fight and uh, and do a lot of damage. They are very quiet. That Siemens Prime Mover is amazing. Very few moving parts, with the exception of the shaft itself. So by eliminating all the additional pumps and support lube oil things that happen in a normal propulsion system by getting rid of all that and making it a chemical process to generate electricity with no moving parts other than the actual shaft output and the motor itself uh, is, is a huge evolutionary step in submarine warfare. And it's very quiet. The, the design is outstanding. I, I give this, um, you know, out of all the sub reefs I've done so far for diesel boats, the highest grade, it, it is very well engineered. And we wouldn't expect anything less from our friends over in Germany. They did a great job. And in Italy, too. Don't forget, Italy definitely had a part of this design. But uh, that that Siemens primary, you know, the prime mover is what we call it in the Navy. The uh, main engine is just really incredible. And they put together a lot of really good technologies here in one platform that make this extremely capable, extremely capable diesel boat. So I'm blown away by it. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Captain Jive Turkey. I appreciate all the support you guys are showing on the Patreon and other sites. Uh, some of these sub briefs uh, may become available as an audiobook format, but as long as you're a Patreon, you'll always have access to the video and all the additional research. And it's also less expensive than the audiobooks. Um, I'll have more updates on that later. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye.